you know, I realized in the morning service, a lot of people were like, what is up with all the post notes? Like, like they just, if they've never been to this space, they don't know. But yet here, like, you're literally surrounded by prayer right now. Like, like surrounded by prayer. Um, God is good. And all the time. Love, I didn't even mean to do that. I was just trying, I was just trying to say the truth, and it happens, right? Love also, like, I'm excited for this word, not just because, I mean, cause is hyping it up, so I'm like, God's definitely got something going on. He hasn't even heard this one. He's like, yeah, God's going to move. I'm like, praise God, he's going to move. But also, it's like you're coming off of 24-hour prayer. You know that you're going off of the Spirit and not much else. Um, it's the same, like, you're coming off of a long fast where it's like, I know, like, how am I still on my feet? Because the Lord's with me. There's no other way, <laughs> right? Um, I am excited to be able to bring the word uh, this evening, talking about a better way. Pastor Nathan um, gave a absolute fire word this morning. I really encourage you guys to go check it out um, on our YouTube channel, as I will plug the YouTube channel there. Um, but it's, I also love that we are going from the same passage, but having very different messages on faith. I love that because the depth of God's word is applicable for everyone in every season, and it never gets boring. It never gets dry. That God always has something deeper for us, something richer for us. May we never grow tired of God's word. Good. Yes. All right. God, I thank you for today. God, we thank you for just the grace that you've given us. Lord, we thank you for showing up again and again and again that you were here for us all of 24-hour prayer, and yet you are here again this evening. God, we don't take that for granted. Lord, we love you. We ask that you would speak this night. God, that our hearts would be open and sensitive. God, even that you would increase, that I would decrease, and I would even be open to speaking more and more what you want. Lord, have your way with us tonight and increase our faith. Amen. 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 So we're in Mark 11, and now a couple weeks ago we had Easter. I was just thinking of Palm Sunday. This is the last week of Jesus' life. So Mark 11 picks up. Jesus has been teaching all throughout Galilee, and then he is on his way into Jerusalem. And Mark 11 has that pivot point where he is now in Jerusalem, and this is the final week of his life. And it is a wild couple of days. You're just thinking of the disciples. You have the triumphal entry. They're going in. This is the, man, Jesus is going to be king. Like, people are shouting his name and Hosanna in the streets. People are taking off their jackets, throwing it on the ground, cutting off palm trees, laying it there. It's like, Jesus is our king. He's, he's going to do it. He's going to replace Rome. He's going to free us. Man, this is it, right? And then goes into the temple, takes a lap around. It's like, it's so late because it's just all the crowd getting there that he doesn't even get to the temple until late because there was such an uproar in the city. And the disciples are just like, this is it. This is what's going to happen. This is going to be it. It's going to be it. And they go home that night back to Bethany. They're staying like a couple miles away from Jerusalem. And then the next day, man, like, they get up and they're like, man, what's going to happen next? They're walking. They got some, they still see some palm trees on the ground. Like Bartholomew's over there looking to see if anybody left their coat somewhere. You know, like maybe I can get a spare coat from this too. And they're just gone. And then Jesus is like, man, I'm, I'm kind of hungry. How about we go over there? And like John's like, oh yeah, I mean, I saw him building this whip last night. Maybe that's why he missed breakfast this morning. And so he ends up going up there, goes to this tree that is just in full leaf and it's a fig tree. And all of a sudden he ends up like, May you never bear fruit again because you don't have any fruit on you. And the disciples are like, well, that's weird. And then they just keep going into Jerusalem, right? So they go into Jerusalem and then Jesus starts turning over tables, uses the whip that he built, and he's casually teaching everybody as he's destroying small businesses. Okay? Like, yeah, sure, some people had ledgers, but like, let's be real. There were some small businesses destroyed in that moment. God destroying people's livelihood in there. Jesus is like, and again, the disciples are like, man, God, Jesus has authority over the temple. Again, like, this is it. He's, man, this is incredible. Kicks everybody out, doesn't let anybody even carry anything through there. I don't know how long that took. But then he spends the rest of the day healing people. Matthew says that people were coming into the temple and Jesus was just healing people the entire day. Right? 
And then like, I'm imagining they go home late at night. And again, like the disciples are like, day three, what's going to happen? What's going on? God is on a roll. Like Jesus is showing up. Like this is it. What's going on? And then as they walk back to Jerusalem, Peter ends up seeing that tree they passed earlier. And again, this was off in the distance. It's like that tree that was full in leaf, all of a sudden, it's withered to the root. They're walking by. And this was, again, imagine like a block away, an av, like looking down the av. Yesterday I saw these trees lush, and now I look down that av, and that tree is like withered, leafless, and dead. Peter goes up, and we pick up there. And I'm just thinking of all the, all the questions that is roaring up in the disciples. Jesus, you're, you're changing things, you're moving. What did that tree do? What, why? Why did you do that? Jesus, it's not even the season for figs. Why did you curse that? Why did you kill that thing? Can't you just focus on raising up the, like, the new Jerusalem, becoming king, tearing down all the bad things? Why did you curse this tree? Why is this going on? It's deeply frustrating to me that Jesus doesn't answer any of those questions. We look at his question, like the disciples coming, picking up at verse 20. As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, have faith in God. That's my why. It doesn't answer any of my why. It doesn't answer any of my questions, Lord. Jesus said, no, have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says, says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive, if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also, who is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. I like knowing why things happen. And God sometimes is really uninterested in telling us why. I even just, I think of why I like know what's going on. I like seeing the whole picture. Sometimes that turns into, God, just, just one more episode before I go to sleep. <laughs> right? Anybody? Right? So just one more chapter. Just one more episode. I just got to know. Or it's like, man, I, I think that person said something about me. I've got to know. Let me ask everybody around, see what's going on. Oh, I've got to know if that person approves of me. I've got to know why, what they think of me. I've got to know. I've got to know. And all of these concerns, and honestly, some of these anxiousness that comes up from like, I need to know why. I need to understand. And even the more I looked at this passage, the more I dug into it, the more I realized the reason I want to know why Jesus curred the fig tree is because I want to know if I, was, if I agree with him or not. Do I agree? Is that a good reason to curse that, Jesus? Maybe if you tell me why, then I can agree if it's a good reason or not. Instead of trusting, if you're doing it, then I have to trust it. The reality is also that Jesus knew the whole story. He knew what, was he, what he was about to do. You keep going into chapter 12. Jesus goes into the temple and he tells a parable that is directly paralleling the situation with the fig tree. That it was talking about a fruitless temple that looks great from a distance, looks like it's fantastic, but it is fruitless. And he's talking about tenants that are like uh, the owner of the land is going to come back in season and say, hey, it's time to give fruit and they won't give it up. And it is a righteous thing for him to condemn them who kill his servants coming for something that he owns. How much more so the fig tree? Because the actual, the demonstration of the fig tree is how much more do we need to give fruit to the Lord? But in this moment, in the moment in between, in between, I heard the curse and now I'm seeing the death of the tree and I have no reason why Jesus is, 
not answering my questions. What he's actually doing is telling me how to live in the in-between. Because I don't need to know why, I need to know who. And I don't need to know why something happened. I need to know how to operate in the middle. And that is have faith in God. Even with this, there's um, two people in this church. I won't share their names because people know them, but I did get permission from both of them to tell this story. Um, girl ended up moving um, to New York and just, it was a God thing going through, but it's new to the city. She's walking through some stuff from her past and meets this guy, guy and girl. You know, they start feeling, start happening, going through that. Girl ends up finally asking, asking this guy if they could talk. And she ends up telling him, it's like just wrestling with it. They'd gone, like they got to know each other, hanging out a lot. And then she ends up asking him like, hey, look, I realize I don't want to be friends. I want to be more than friends. But this is what I'm feeling the Lord telling me, that I need to be in community. And I actually need to walk through healing before I can step into something. This guy was telling me, like one, he just thought that was very attractive. Yeah. Is like a godly man finding a woman that actually cares more about what God says in that direction than what she thinks of him, right? And so she's choosing to follow the Lord in that. And this guy is like, in that moment, he was telling me like, what do you say to that? It's like, he sat there in process and it's like, you know, you don't get to know how he feels. Like he, that's what he ended up telling her. It's like, you don't get to know how I feel in this moment. Because if you know how I feel, it's just gonna mess you up in doing what you need to do. That you need to have faith in what God's calling you to and not be concerned about the outcome. Now, again, I know how that story ends. I'll share that later. But the reality is, is in the moment, it's just having to have faith that, God, I'm trusting you because I don't feel like that's what I want to do. That is not at all what I want to do, right? But God, you're calling me, and I'm going to say yes to what you're doing because you know better. And again, this is have faith in God. Sometimes we'd like having faith in our faith right? If I can just faith hard enough, then it'll happen, right? If I can just believe hard enough, then it'll happen. Maybe if I understand why, then I can figure this out and I can step into it instead of like, no, 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 God, that he is able to fulfill every promise he gives. And even more so that he is eager to, that he is eager to fulfill the promises he has. You go through all of Hebrews 11, these are men and women of faith that they looked at God. They didn't even see most of the promises that God had. And yet they still like, no, God is faithful and that he will provide. This faith in God alone, not in the process. God, I want actually, can you show me the whole five-step process before I take this first step? <laughs> right? Anybody else? All right. God, I like, look, I'm, I'm willing to obey you in this, but can you tell me the whole story first? <laughs> because that first step really doesn't make sense. Instead of actually, oh God, okay, if I see the outcome, if I know how this is going to end, then I'll go through. Oh, Pastor Nathan was sharing his story of like getting up on a, like the Lord convicting him to go and like share the gospel on a subway train. And it's one of those like, I don't know how this is going to end right? But I just have to obey in the moment. I know for me, like a lot of times in mission trips, I will like, man, we were, okay. We were in Pakistan. Um, we we're going around, we were working with a YWAM, which is youth with a mission. Um, and we were just, we were preaching on faith, preaching apologetics. Uh, I was sharing just the power of God and healing. Um, and then as we we're driving some other people to the airport, to the missionaries that have been chauffeuring us around the whole time, it's like, hey, we're going to go to this guy's house. He's paralyzed because he had a stroke three months ago. You're going to pray for him. He's going to be healed. No pressure. Um, just sitting there. I'm like, okay, God, I don't know what to do in this moment. 
What's the outcome of this? You want me to pray for somebody to be healed? What if it doesn't happen? What if the person is still sitting there afterwards? I don't have faith in an outcome because I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know where it's going to go. But I have faith in God that he's going to show up and do something. We got there, ended up praying for this person, and no, he didn't stand up. But he, his right hand was paralyzed. His whole right half of his body was paralyzed from the stroke, and he was sitting, and he ended up... Um, I had him shake my hand with his right hand, like he's kind of sitting there holding it, and the Lord was just telling me, it's like, have him shake my hand, or have him shake your hand, because he would sit there and move his right hand. I'd ask him to kind of test it out, and he'd sit there and move it, and he'd times like, hey, move your right hand. He used his left hand and moved his right hand. And I was like, no, 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 just try moving your right hand. Moved his left, his left hand. And the Lord just gave me a word. That's how he obeys me. Every single time, he does what I ask him to do, but I always have to force him to do it and I'm tired of doing it. I want him to partner with me. And the same thing of like a handshake, it takes two people to go up. You know, have you ever shake somebody's hand that's just like limp hand? Ugh, right? And God's like, no, have him shake your hand. So I end up taking his hand and I just gave him that word. Hey, look, this is what you've been doing and this is the, what the Lord's inviting you into. And I share like, like in the name of Jesus be healed. Shake my hand. And he puts this death grip on my hand and my hand turns white. All of his family is sitting on the bed next to him. I look at him like, did you feel that? He's like, yeah, his eyes are wise. I looked at, his, at the family like, did you see that? He's like, yeah. I'm like, okay, this is what you have to do. You have to start stepping in faith every morning. I want you to just, with the Lord, God, I'm partnering with you, raising your hand, just squeezing your hand. He went from not being able to move his right hand to simply that. But it's again where are you taking a step of faith? Because God's wanting to do a lot more than the outcome I think of. Because God's wanting to change a heart and a life and a family, not just a body. Right? But if I have faith in an outcome and not in a God, then he's limited to the outcomes I can imagine. God has faith for way more and he wants to do way, way more. Right? Right? But it's also saying like, right, Jesus, why'd you curse the fig tree? I want to know if I agree if that's a good reason or not. Maybe if I have faith in God, then I have to trust him to decide what's right and wrong. What was the tree that Adam and Eve ate from? The knowledge of good and evil. They decide, you know what? I'm going to take the knowledge of good and evil for myself. The one thing God said, let me hold on to this, guys. Let me hold on to deciding what's good and evil. I want to give you life. But when we sit there and I'm like, no, God, I want to decide what's right and wrong. I don't want to decide what's good and evil. But if I have faith in him, then I have to say, you know what? You say you want to decide this, then I want to let you decide that. And not have to sit in judgment of God. What if as a people, we lay down the burden of, trying, of having to decide what's right and wrong, of having to always muscle through and for us to decide, and we actually just trust the Lord. Look, as a people, we have a hard enough time deciding where we're going to go to eat after, like for dinner after service, okay? Like, why do we think we can decide what's good and evil, right? What if we lay down that burden? Imagine the freedom you'd have. Imagine the peace you have of not having to constantly stress about that, of having to constantly worry if you agree with everybody else around you instead of, God, you're leading me. What would a community of faith look like that said, we have faith in our God to decide what's right and wrong, and we trust his decisions over our own and over the, our cultures? And what if a community of faith had more faith in their God than their processes. Yeah. What if we, as a community, as a church, had more faith in our God than our government? Yes, sir. Had more faith in our God for provision and providing for us than our jobs, our paychecks? Had more faith in our God to lead us than in our past experiences? 
What if we had more faith in our God than our own understanding? How far could God take us? What would he do? We can't even imagine it. So this is Jesus explaining how, but he also modeled it. He didn't just teach on it. He also ended up modeling this in this moment that Jesus just goes up. If you read the passage before, and I don't think the team has this, but in 12, um, on the following day when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, may no, may no one ever eat free, um, fruit from you again. And the disciples heard it. This is like a passing comment that Jesus made. He's about to go clear the temple, and I'm like, I need faith for that, right? I need some faith to go up and clear the temple, right? It's like, you want me to do what? You want me to overturn tables? You want me to do this? Like, that's a big moment. Okay, I need faith for that. Jesus is like, no, do I have faith just to go get something to eat? That faith was something that just oozed out of Jesus, that every word he said carried weight because he believed that it was going to be done. If you want a scary thought, what if a community of faith believed that what they said was going to happen? What would it sound like? What would our conversations sound like with each other if we believed that what we said was going to come to pass? And look, we got a men's group. Some of the guys are, are here. We meet on Thursday nights. And we're all about, like, we'll rib each other occasionally, we'll poke fun, but at a certain point, like, we cross a line where it's like, do you believe that's going to happen? Do you believe that about somebody? And again, like, not, not bashing on joking, but at the same time where, like, would we be as coarse with our words if we believe that what we're saying is going to happen? Do we have faith for that? But again, like where Jesus just exuded faith in every moment. And honestly, that's the faith I want. Yes, I want faith for the big things. Yes, I want faith for the breakthrough to see those things. But Jesus had faith in every moment of his life. That it wasn't just for the moments where we need it. It was the moments that seemed inconsequential. And also like, Look, of all the miracles Jesus could have used to explain and teach on faith, why in the world did he use this one? Jesus like spit on the ground, made mud, put it in a guy's face, and he had him go and he was healed of blindness. All right? Jesus teach on faith from there. <laughs> you know, you just told this lame man, get up and walk. And he immediately got up and walked. No, he uses this of all things. It's also, so now this is getting just into the text. The book of Mark, I think immediately is Mark's favorite word. It's mentioned somewhere between 30 to 40 times in the book of Mark, depending on which translation you're looking at. Immediately, Jesus casts out demons. He said a word and immediately the person was healed. And immediately, and immediately, and immediately. And then Jesus says to a fruit tree, you're not going to bear any fruit. And then it waits. But he said it, he knew it, and he just walked like it was done. The, the reason I think that he used this to teach faith is because it's easy to have faith when we say something and it immediately happens. It's harder when we have to wait. It's harder when I have to trust God to do it and not see it immediately. And again, again like personal example. So when I'm going to like casually say some of this stuff and it's going to like hit notes and we'll, go, and we'll run with it. Um, in my freshman year of college, I was miraculously healed of a broken foot. So my bones were growing incorrectly, like the bones in the foot, instead of growing parallel, they were growing separate. Um, doctor had to go in, break the bone, put in the right spot and pin it. And this was all when God was actually introducing me to the power of God. 
that he wasn't just a far off pin pal that I knew, but he was actually tangibly wanting to be in my life, right? That he wanted to, me to encounter him. And so I am seeking him and end up, we're at a prayer meeting. We were at a 24 hour prayer meeting. Um, and we were there and we had five of my friends come up to me like, man, I don't know what this is, but God just spoke to all of us at different times tonight. It's like, we just think God really wants to heal you tonight. I'm like, all right, cool. He either heals me or he doesn't. Like, that's kind of where I was at. They pray for me. I take this medical boot off and I start walking around. I start running around. I did a lap around the church. It's like, it was in the South where you actually could, like, there wasn't like, <laughs> it wasn't the block that actually had a yard, you know? Um, or like run around this. And like, I should not have been able to do any of that. Like God healed my foot. Now the part of this, that's usually when I just t tell the short version of that story, that's usually where I stop. The reality is, is that my foot hurt when I did that. I know I should not have been able to do any of it, but there was still pain in doing it, All right? And just something gripped my soul with a gift of faith that, no, God, you healed me. And I'm going to walk this. I had a small brace um, that I was wearing underneath the medical boot that just helped put kind of like hold, hold, hold. You know, I, I didn't sleep much the past couple of days, so just forgive me with words. Um, I had a smaller brace that I was wearing underneath my shoe that just helped hold the, the toes in alignment so they could heal properly. And I was wearing that and that I had a, like a brace factor. The next morning, I'm going to my 8 a.m. lab class, as one does. Um, and the Lord just ended up telling me like, hey, if it's healed, walk like it's healed. And I felt very convicted, like, no, if God healed my foot, then I don't need a brace for this. And so I knew that I felt like I needed to throw this brace away. Now, again, I was operating in radical faith. This is not necessarily the most wise thing, and this is not what I counsel people even when I pray for healing and I see it, okay? Like, we pray for, we pray for some athletes at Cincinnati, a whole bunch of people got healed, and we're like, go talk to your guys. You know, like, go talk to them. Jesus did this too, like, go talk to the priests, get them to sign off that yes, you were indeed healed. That's not, I was not operating in wisdom at the moment. I just want to like clarify that. Um, you know, but like with this, just I was young. I was like, God had wrecked me in this moment. And I was like, okay, God, I'm going to do this. Threw that, threw that brace away, went to my 8 a.m., walked around the rest of the day and my foot had never hurt more in that moment. But again, I grabbed that word, Lord, you healed me. You did something in me. And I'm going to walk like it's healed. Even if it hurts, I'm going to walk like it's healed. And I end up going to the doctor later that same day. Um, and he, it was just the normal checkup of like, you have a couple checkups after a surgery just to make sure things are progressing well. And again, my foot is killing me at this point. And I'm like, God, this guy's going to tell me I'm insane. Like, and he's going to tell me that I did all these things wrong and like, but I'm trusting you did this. I walk, I'm just walking. I get out of the car again, not the South. We had cars. Um, and as soon as my foot hits the threshold of this doctor's office, all the pain left. I had to kind of like literally like took a step back, <laughs> step forward. <laughs> like what just happened? And again, I'm now just, don't, I'm dumbfounded because I don't know what to do with this situation. My foot, I'm trusting the Lord healed me. There was pain and I'm just fighting. I'm trusting, I'm laboring with the Lord. And then all of a sudden the pain just leaves. And again, I'm thinking like, I don't know what to do, God, but I'm here at the doctor's office. Let's see what he says. Go through, get an x-ray. He doesn't even mention the fact that I'm not wearing the medical boot. Um, he puts it up there and he looks at the x-ray and then he realizes, wait, we wanted you to wear that medical boot a little bit longer. And I'm like, great, I messed up my foot. I tweaked a nerve. <laughs> like this is the things going through my head. And then he looking at the x-ray is like, but apparently it doesn't matter. Your foot's in good alignment and it's healed up more than it should be. I told him what happened and he thought I was crazy, but he was looking at an x-ray that shouldn't have been there. And the idea of, having faith when it is not an immediate answer? Are we willing to take the word of the Lord and walk in faith? Even if we don't see the answer, even if it hurts, are we willing to trust our God? 
not the process, not trust for an answer, but trust our God. That he is more than able. He, Jesus even goes further on this with the idea of like, look, I did this to a tree. You're going to do this to a mountain. That you're going to be able to speak to things and they're going to change and shift in your life. But I feel like what we end up doing is like, all right, mountain move. Now I'm going to wait here until it moves. Instead of, Lord, you've called me to go this way. You've called, okay, mountains in my way. You've told me to move this mountain. All right, mountain move. And I'm going to walk like it was done. Jesus sat there, looked at the fig tree, didn't see any fruit on it, felt a word from the Lord. You're not going to bear any fruit ever again. And it was done. And he walked about. He didn't even turn it into a teaching moment. He just declared the word. It was done. And he left. That he showed this is what it is. But this has to start not from our whims, not from our own desires. I was really wrestling with this because, Jesus, why would you go from talking about moving mountains to like talking about forgiveness? Like, <clears throat> because it really is a matter of alignment. That we have to be aligned with what the Lord is doing. Jesus said that if, look, you ask me of anything in my name, according to my will, it is done. What if you knew that any prayer you, ask, you asked the Lord was going to be done? <clears throat> Those are the prayers I want to pray. When I got a revelation of that, I realized, okay, God, you want to change my heart. You want to make me more like you. You want the fruit of the Spirit flowing in me. You want me to be patient. You want me to be kind. You want me to be loving. That means, God, if I ask you to make me more loving, you're doing it. If I ask you to make me more patient, you're doing it. That he is doing it because it's according to his will. But then I have to first know, God, what do you actually want him to do? And align. And I love this because, look, <clears throat> if while you're in prayer, even this is Pat, like this last thing that Jesus says, and whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your Father also who is in heaven forgive you for your trespasses. Imagine you're in prayer, you're asking the Lord to move mountains, and then you just feel this little like tap on the shoulder of like, hey, you got to let that go. That guy who wronged you, he did wrong you but you got to let it go. And you're like, no, God, move this mountain. If I can't follow the leading of the Lord with something that's, how could I receive that? If the Lord puts on my heart to like, hey, will you let that go? Will you forgive it, that debt? If I'm not willing to do that, how could I receive that? Thinking of it this way, where if I don't trust the Lord um, to carry the debt of somebody else and to either forgive them or take them, like if I don't trust God's justice for somebody else, how and why would I trust God's justice for my own life? Think of it this way, where I think this is a, honestly a hindrance from people receiving forgiveness, is unforgiveness. Because, God, I don't think you're good. I don't think I'm worthy of forgiveness. I don't think that person's worthy of forgiveness. Right? I'm like, why would I forgive them? I don't think you're good enough. But then it's like, okay, God, please forgive me. But then at the end of the day, it was like, I feel like I've forgiven, but I don't actually know, God, if I trust your judgment or not. Because I want to be judge over this person's life. That I want to hold this against somebody. It's really, we have to obey so that we can receive. Oftentimes, the Lord asks you to step into something that he is like wanting to sow something so that you can reap that. If, like if you're wanting an apple, you have to sow an apple seed, right? If I'm wanting forgiveness, maybe I need to sow forgiveness. If I'm wanting a mountain to move, like, Maybe I need to let the Lord move a mountain in my own soul. Maybe I need to agree with what the Lord's wanting to do in my life so that the rest of the world around me would start agreeing with his words through me. 
Pastor Nathan mentioned this so well this morning, and it was something that really gripped my heart one time in prayer on one of our 6 a.m. calls where just praying for miracle signs and wonders to flow in our church through my own life. And I was just gripped by the Lord. It's like, God, why do I think the winds and waves would obey you if I don't? So, Lord, I want to obey you first. I want to choose what you have for me before I ask what you're doing for somebody else. I want to say this so clearly where there is a better way. Forgiveness is an act of faith. It's also where I think it's Jesus' great like, action step from that. Because you have to agree with what the Lord's doing to do it, but I also then have to trust God is going to either take that person to judgment or in a righteous way, or he's going to bring them to repentance. But I have to trust that God is going to make everything right. That's also where we know the end of the story. Jesus is going to come back, and he is going to make every wrong right. He is going to hold everything that was hidden, that was done in secret. He is going to make it into the light. And every single judgment that he will make, every will be, yes, that is just. That is good. That is righteous. And it is because we know that he will make every wrong right, that we can trust him in saying, I can forgive this. I don't need to hold on to this, that I can give it to God because he's going to make it right. I don't have to. But in the middle, when we don't see the wrongs made right, the better way is actually having faith in our God. I mentioned those two people in New York, told you the end of the story. Like, the reason I know that that ends up working out is because I think it's about 37 days we're getting married. In the moment, you don't know, you just have to trust and have faith that God is doing, that he has only good for you. It doesn't mean he has only happiness for you, he has only like uplifting times for you, but every single path that he has for us is good. That our God is worthy of being trusted, that he is trustworthy, that we don't need to know how things go or why something is going on. We don't need to see the whole picture. We don't need to fight over deciding what is right and wrong. We have a God who's gonna take care of it. We have a God who has the best interest in heart for us, and he is able to fulfill it. That he wants to do more in us and through us than we would ever think to ask for that our limited understanding would ever grab a hold of. But will we have faith in God? I think tonight there's just honestly an invitation to release some things. I think even as I've been sharing, Holy Spirit has been kind of tapping you on the shoulder saying it's time to forgive that person. It's time to let that go. Maybe something as simple as like, hey, Pastor Cos was talking about finances. As I've been talking, like, man, that just kept coming in the back of your mind, that idea of like, God, I don't know if I want to give that. I don't know if I want to give that. I want to give you far more than you can receive. Will you trust me with giving this little bit? Again, when I, just out of college, I was raising my financial partnership team where it's just people investing and sowing into what I do in ministry. I can do it. Um, it was just slow going. And I was like, okay, God, over the summer, I'm going to press in. What do you want me to do? Seeking him for direction. It's like, I want you to get with your buddy and I want you to pray every day for this. I'm like, great, done, got that. All right, like, I want you to go to California to raise your partnership team. I'm like, okay, well, I mean, I know some people out there. Like, okay, we'll, we'll do that. 
And I want you to empty your bank account to these three missionaries before you go. Jesus, I don't think that one belongs in the list. You know, how about we just stick to the other two and then you give me something and I can go? This one I did seek wisdom on. I didn't just go for it. I did like, partially because I was wanting somebody to tell me that wasn't the Lord. Um, but I sought some wisdom, got some counsel. I was like, you know, Kenny, I really think that is God. I sat there, I'm like, all right. Empty my bank account. All $400 in it. Wasn't enough to get me to California anyways. But it was all I had. All I have, whether it's $400 or $4 million, it's all I have. And I had to sit there in faith and gave this. And all of a sudden I started meeting somebody like, hey, you're going to California? Hey, let me, let me pay for your rental car while you're while you there. Or you're going there? I actually, like, I want to pay for your flight. Meeting with somebody, telling them about what I do, and it's like, I asked him if there's anybody that he thought would be interested in hearing about what I do. And he's like, man, actually, there is, man. There's one friend, I think they would absolutely love what you're doing. The only problem is, is that they're in Southern California. And I don't know if you're ever going there. I'm like, well, funny enough, Again, but I had to walk in faith because even when I went out there, I had meeting after meeting after meeting and I raised nothing. I'm like, God, I gave everything I had and you provided and got me here. What are you doing? The answers I keep getting was like, look, Kenny, we love what you do. We just can't give right now. We're tapped out. Like, can you come back to us later? And I come back and again where, all right, God, I, I don't know. I was faithful though. I, have, I feel like I have nothing to show for my faithfulness, but I was faithful. Then all of a sudden the Lord calls me to move to New York City. And the finances that had taken me about two years to build, I had to triple in 50 days. All of a sudden, all those conversations that I had with those people in California were able to give. And everything that I had, what took me two years to build, God tripled in 50 days. We don't see the outcome right now, but do we have faith in our God? Lord, we thank you that you are trustworthy, Lord that you are worthy of our trust, you are worthy of our adoration and worship. God, you are. Trusting you is a better way than our own way. Right now, Lord, just even as he's highlighting, maybe those, some of those people you need to forgive, or maybe that one thing like maybe you need to sow into, or maybe that conversation that you just needed to have, maybe to ask for forgiveness. Just take a moment with the Lord and release that. Step into that. Thank you, Lord. God, we ask that you would have your way and stir in us this better way of faith.